right, hello, and welcome to Climate Change Roundtable. Um, I'm going to keep the intro very brief this week, uh, partially because we lost a, uh, a frankly, a warrior in the, the climate realism movement, and um, I, I don't really want to do this, you know, awkward or semi-funny, not usually very funny intro. So what I really want to do is actually, uh, we lost Dr. Patrick Michaels earlier this week. It's incredibly sad, uh, and I'd like to show you all just a video clip of of him in action because he he truly was just a warrior and a trailblazer in this movement. So I'm just going to start with that right now. So uh, the, was the professor's use of the word trick in an email an attempt at climate change inception? What about the scientific data? Do the leaked messages make it tougher to convince people? Patrick Michaels is one of the skeptics. He's a senior fellow in environmental studies at the Cato Institute. And on the other side, a familiar face, Bill Nye, the science guy. Patrick, let me start with you. Just to be clear, you believe that climate change is real and that man contributes to it, but not a, it's not as catastrophic as some fear, and it's probably not something man can really reverse. So if that's correct, what about these emails troubles you? Well, a lot of it troubled, a lot of what troubled me were the attempts to uh, hide things from Freedom of Information Acts. You've got to wonder what's being hidden. Listen to this one, Phil Jones to Mike Mann. It's short, don't worry. Can you delete any emails you may have had with Keith, that's Briffa, read the latest UN report. Keith will do the likewise. Can you also email Gene and get him to do the same? We will be getting Casper to do likewise. Oh my God. And the subject line for that email is FOI, Freedom of Information. And you were actually That's mentioned what in the world in some of these emails. They were actually yes. talking about you. What did they say about you? Yeah, well, they, they, they did not like the fact that I had a bunch of articles published in the refereed literature and so they decided they would see who the editors were for those journals and try and influence uh, their editorial decisions in the future. Uh, one famous one says, we may have lost control over climate research. We don't want to lose, I think it's geophysical research letters, lose control. These guys are saying that they have control over what goes into the scientific literature and they're going to threaten editors if they publish papers by me or my apparently few friends. That's really dangerous because it biases the refereed literature. Mm. And that's the canon of science that we all rely upon to make our consensual decisions. Bill Nye, what about that? I mean, you've read the, the hacked emails. Uh, Patrick seems to have a point. Uh, you know, trying to manipulate peer-reviewed journals doesn't seem like a pretty particularly ethical thing to do. Well, having read the emails uh, to the best of my ability, with regard to the expression climate research, that refers to a specific journal that a specific scientist Correct. doesn't especially care for. So there you go. The world's still getting warmer. Humans are still to blame. You, you say so the emails, when you, when you get into it uh, carefully, the emails are guys who are generally very, very concerned about the efficacy, about the quality of their research. And their concern is that people like Dr. Michaels are going to scrutinize it so carefully that they will be able to discredit it without really embracing the overall message. So it's a concern. These emails were hacked. People referred to other people as idiots. I am very confident that each of the three of us has been called an idiot from time to time. But the details in the emails are extraordinary. And the, the, the work that these people are trying to do, trying to cover so many details, so many millions of data that have to be analyzed over centuries and trying to coordinate this is very, very difficult business. Patrick, let me and ask sure you. enough, if you go through them carefully enough, you find uh, no, phrases that are Patrick, out of context. Patrick, what, what, in your mind, do you have any question that there was a deliberate attempt to manipulate and skew, and skew the data to, to, to have particular Absolutely. conclusions? Absolutely. They said that they wanted to get, uh, they wanted to boycott certain journals if they published certain articles. Now, that means that the, that the editors will, will all of a sudden uh, certainly view things that might get them a boycott with a little bit of trepidation. And in fact, there were resignations from these journals. And another one, geophysical research Isn't letters. Isn't a boycott good uh, for they you? They thought though? they had a problem. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, these guys are major contributors to journals. Anyway, another one, geophysical research letters, they said they had a problem with an editor because he was at University of Virginia. Well, just because I was there doesn't mean the editor is biased. So, Bill, Bill and, uh, then they said the leak was plugged there. Bill, Come for, on, for, for Bill. you, Bill, this doesn't raise concerns about about the does it raise concerns for you, Bill, about the vast research on climate change that's been produced over the last few years, not just from this university, but just in general. 
Now, when you refer to that university, by the way, right now, that university is where those data are stored. They have that responsibility. So, no, it doesn't. I think uh, just as the uh, gentleman you had from East Anglican University referred, uh, made mention, when these things are carefully reviewed, you'll see that there's uh, people are chasing ghosts or phantoms. It's not that serious a business. It, uh, that's it's not chasing ghosts to say, can you all delete all your sure. emails, each and every one of you, to, in response to a FOIA request? So here's <laughs> another problem. If you, you're a public figure. Have you ever been audited? Uh, you're talking to me? When you're audited, I'm it's sure, yeah. either one of you. It's a very, uh, Dr. Michaels, it's a very difficult business when you're audited. So apparently, my understanding from what I could infer from this email, for example, they have a requirement to report within 20 days. This is in the United Kingdom. That's quite a burden. People are in the middle of their academic research. They might have obligations to teach classes. So to be, uh, to have, so uh, we all. in my uh, interpretation of the word skeptic, to have this burden to report in 20 days, they go, oh, geez, we just don't want to bother. So bottom line, get involved so, let's, so let's delete the emails. Un unfortunately, we're out of time. So, but Bill Nye, for you, basically, this does not change matters. Patrick, for you, uh, this is a no, smoking No, in fact, gun. it reinforces them for me. The planet's still still warmer than it was, but there are a lot of problems that are not going to go away because of these emails. Uh, Patrick Michaels, uh, Bill, and I wish we had well, more time, but I do appreciate both your different perspectives. Still getting warmer, and we still have to do something. Thank you, Anderson. All right, thanks, guys. All right, all right. Can uh, I can I say it since they mentioned since since uh, Bill and I mentioned it? Wow, I want to say it, Bill and I, the idiot guy. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh man, some of his newer stuff is horrible. But yeah, I mean, um, does that clip not exemplify just how good he was? Look, Pat, Pat was, um, look, he was a, a generous fellow with his time. He, uh, um, Roy Spencer uh, put it, you know, put it best in one sense. He says he was Roy Spencer's go-to guy to know what the state of climate science was, you know, because Patrick was constantly combing the literature to see what new studies were going on, what they were finding. Were there problems? Well, you know, he he was and he was in communication with everybody. But most importantly, by Pat, and it was demonstrated, you know, I think quite well in this uh, this video clip you provided, was he was a great communicator. Um, you know, Pat was a, a friend. I've known him for twenty six years now, and it's a great loss. But it, it, he he was award winning. He published in the peer reviewed literature. He published or co authored or edited nine books on climate change. Uh, his loss to the scientific community can't be overstated. But what's really, I think, uh, sets him apart from many climate scientists, from many people on our side or the other side, is his ability to communicate the message, uh, to get people interested, to, to, to make an audience, a lay audience, realize how ridiculous some of the claims are to get them laughing about it because <laughs> it's just so stupid and ludicrous. He was not, you know, we, we talk about being climate skeptics or climate realists. He called himself a lukewarmer. He, he invented the term, are, actually. Yeah, he invented the term. He 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 says uh, humans are causing climate change or, or not causing them. Humans are contributing to the present climate change, but it's not a disaster. And you know why it's not a disaster? Because the data says so. Because here's the copious amount of research that shows a modestly warming world is not bad for us, but good for us. And he just nailed anyone who um, who tried to argue without evidence to the contrary. And he would go through papers and find where other researchers, researchers who who are promoting alarm in their own documents say, look, this is a PR war. We've got to win the PR battle. It, so it's not about science. It's about some goal, some political goal they have. Yeah, completely agreed. Um, Anthony, you, uh, you just sent me something. Um, I don't know if you want to bring it up. Well, uh, I don't know if it'll, okay, great. This single graph here is really, the, the biggest legacy of Pat Michaels. Now, I haven't known Pat as long as Sterling has, but I knew him pretty well. And he he's a lot like I am in that the data tells the story. Let the data tell the story. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. 
the data tells the story. Yeah. And he basically eviscerated global warming in its early phases back when they were doing, um, you know, the early IPCC reports. And there was this paper published by Ben Santer. Um, and Ben Santer worked at uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in California. And he published um, a paper that basically was supporting that, you know, global warming is a big problem. The problem is, is that this scientist, this federally funded scientist, Ben Santer, cherry picked the data he used and Michaels called him on it. Not mm -hmm. just in terms of like, you know, uh, back then we didn't have blogs or whatever, but you know, he published a scientific rebuttal in nature. He and Chip Nappenberger basically showed that the period that um, Santer used in the IPCC report was picked specifically to illustrate warming. And if you use the entire record, as you can see in the graph, outside of that circled area, there's no trend at all. They mm -hmm. manufactured a crisis. They manufactured a crisis. Santer simply lied. He picked the data that fit his predetermined conclusion. He published it and he lied. It's as simple as that. And Patrick Michaels called him on it. And this should have been the whole end of the IPCC that they allowed this crap through. Unfortunately, because by then the steamroll of money was going, it became more important to save the funding than it was to save the science. But this is really the biggest contribution that Pat made to quashing down the alarm. And um, I, I got to tell you, it's just sickening the way that they treated him. Santa is on record in the emails uh, the, the leaked climate gate emails yeah. are saying, I'd like to meet Patrick Michaels in a dark alley some night, <laughs> implying wow. that he was going to beat them out of him. That's the kind of people that we're dealing with here that are pushing the science. I mean, good Lord. Now, anyway, fortunately, Sanders retired and he's out of the picture now. But that the kind of, of just epic meanness associated with these people. That, that, you know, happened after they got exposed is just amazing. I mean, Roy you know, Spencer's you office was shot at. Like, it's another example of yeah. the exact same mindset. I, I can't think of anyone shooting at people that advocate for, you know, a climate emergency. I can think of examples of people shooting at people that say there aren't an emergency. It's just, yeah. uh, yeah. you know, uh, you shared another an anecdote uh, in your post on this earlier this week, Anthony, concerning his only regret was hiring. <laughs> Uh, um, oh gosh, I'm having a senior moment there, Anthony. Who who was it he hired? I can picture him, bald, black hair with a little beard. Uh, oh, oh, um, oh gosh, I'm lost too. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Welcome to the senior now. moment channel. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Michael Mann. He, yeah. he hired. Oh, he uh, hired Michael Mann. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, when he was at University of Virginia, yeah. uh, Mann and he were at Virginia at the same time. It, yeah. It, even yeah. as this climate gate stuff was going on, it wasn't until after that or around then that Mann went to Pennsylvania, and uh, Michaels was instrumental to getting him hired. You know, at the time, Michaels was the state climatologist of, of the state of Virginia. He uh, he, uh, you know, uh, was prominent in uh, uh, various societies. Uh, and there it is, uh, right there yeah yeah so uh it's it's uh <laughs> you know that was one of his regrets but uh you know now we all have regrets i regret that i didn't talk to him more uh i regret that i didn't interview him for uh heartland's uh daily podcast more it turns out i looked back over 300 podcast 360 odd podcast i've done i only interviewed my pat twice though mm -hmm. I, I a keyword search found that he was mentioned by other people in a number of these podcasts. And that's not surprising. Like I said, uh, of all the books, you, you can read many books about climate change. Few of them were more entertaining and accessible to lay people than those produced by Pat Michaels. You know, yeah. I, I don't know him nearly as well as you all did, but what one thing I have noticed just watching uh, materials on climate change over the years is he was frequently the guy that would appear on the opposition's videos. The guy that would be like, I'm I'm willing to go on here, get lambasted by you all, but tell tell you, you know, what's actually going on, which is just, you know, a brave and b just, you know, I, I respect that. Just people just be willing to take the criticism. There are numerous people who worked with Mike. I mean, with Pat, sorry, 
over the years, prominent scientists, good scientists who worked with him on books, who worked with him on award-winning articles, uh, who uh, debate, who were on stage on the on his side of the debate stage, who have stopped doing climate work under the pressure and the constant barrage and the constant uh, criticisms and the threats, who just said, "Look, we think they're destroying the science. We think they're lying about things, but I just have a life to live, and I'm going to yeah. not do this anymore." Pat Michaels never gave up. He kept fighting yeah. for it. And man, that's uh, that's a testament. It is. And because I know that, well, I'm, I know you, Sterling, and it certainly goes through my mind. You know, why do I put up with this? Why do I make my life miserable by having people attack me and call me a climate denier and a shill for big oil and all these other lies that they produce regularly because they have nothing to rebut what we say factually? That's, that is the challenge of being a skeptic today. And I mean, the, the amount of abuse that Patrick Michaels took um, the was vitriol. huge. And, yeah. and we, ex we still experience it every day. And it makes you wonder, why do we do this? But you have to, you have to. Truth is what it's about. And I got to tell you, yes, it's getting warmer. No, it's not a crisis. But some of the things that are published in climate science are patently untrue, as was demonstrated by what Patrick Michaels exposed about Ben Center. Yeah, I mean, and I'll just say as a young person, it is frightening to be young early in your career and talk about this stuff because we are uh, ostracized and blackballed. I mean, at least you all have been in the industry for a while. <laughs> like if you get blackballed, you gotta, you gotta, you, you've got you built something up for, for us. It's like, oof, if we get blackballed, it's very early on. But um, it's kind of hard to transition away from this topic just because it's such a serious thing. Does anyone have any, any last uh, words they want to say before we move on? We do have other things to get to. You know, I would say to anyone who's young and who's in college and might be watching this, don't be afraid to speak truth to power. That's what Pat Michaels did. And that's what we do every day. Don't be afraid to do it. Yes, you're going to get abuse. But remember, these people are just, you know, they're they're mental midgets nipping at your heels with insults. Speak <laughs> to the follow, truth. I love, I love that. To follow <laughs> up on that, to follow up on that, you know, the sad, the sad truth is, so I was very, very young in the 60s, but I remember when Me liberals too. on campus, liberals on campus held up signs saying question authority. Yep. And 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 uh, and we're constantly saying, you know, you can't trust authority that you should speak your mind, that the most important virtue on campuses was the freedom to express yourself and that is dead. Liberals are just the opposite. They're not liberal. They're ir they're illiberal nowadays on campus. You can speak your mind as long as you agree with evidently authority and the <laughs> dominant mean, uh, at least on some topics. You know, if, yeah. if you want to uh, defend the police, you're not so welcome. But if you want to defend government uh, agencies and their reports and, uh, uh, bigger government and the UN taking over things, mm -hmm. you can speak well. But if you want to fight that, if you want to speak out against that, if you question authority, as, you, as they used to call on you to do, not no more. This is, I mean, this is just a theory of mine, but I feel like every single human being needs something that they need to put their their faith in. Uh, conservatives will office, often put it in God. Yeah. I'm personally atheist. I think liberals put their faith in government and centralized power. And that's why you can't question it. It's what they they view as ultimate truth. Uh, feel free to disagree. It's just a theory I have. Linnea, you haven't had a chance to say anything, but you've got a unique experience in that you've come out of, of the educational institutions and you went straight into then petroleum engineering and now straight into climate realism. And I mean, that's a fast track to, to abuse and hatred. Uh, what's, what's been your experience with this? Well, my experience in college, gosh, I mean, I, I took a geochemical cycles course where they taught us some of, of the basics on the modeling. And um, I realized very quickly that it was the, the issue of garbage in, garbage out, that you can just tell these things what result you want essentially by what you put in um 
you know, the teacher will say this is the impact of carbon dioxide on uh, how much energy is captured at the Earth's surface. And that's the number that you plug in. And there's really no questioning that. That was one of the standard values that you had to put in in order to uh, get the correct result in order to pass the class. Right. So it was, um, you know, and I knew that that was nonsense uh, and that there's still a lot of questions about that. But, you know, you really kind of got to keep your head down a little bit in order to get through it in college. Um, I think that, you know, there were some areas where you could more easily stand up and expect that you can still pass your coursework. Uh, but yeah. it's, I don't know if it's quite so simple as, you know, um, just protest everything all the time. It's really, really tough. And I, you know, I wish I could have been a little bit more brave sometimes, but even in petroleum engineering, you know, uh, in the oil field, they're, they're pretty much all in on the climate change stuff too. So <laughs> having come really? to work here. Oh yeah. I mean, not, not everyone, you know, you, you're sitting at so work. They, they're, they're on one hand yelling drill, baby drill. On the other hand, they're yelling, save the planet at the same time. What pretty much. Hell? Well, and you can go to, you can go to any corporate website for any of these companies and they'll have oh, a huge ESG right, right. section, a huge sustainability. Mm -hmm. And the climate tab will be like the first tab on their it's uh, good business list. Practice. Well, yeah, that and but also, you know, I'll never forget I, one of my first maybe second hitch offshore. I was standing up on uh, one of the uh, areas that you didn't need to have your PPE on, you know, no helmet, no coveralls and everything. And I was standing having a little bit of coffee and there was a person that was a, a corporate representative or one of the company men from um, whatever major company it was that was running that job. Uh, and I was standing out there and I was like, man, it's gotta be like a hundred degrees on this deck because it's all metal decks everywhere. So even if it's in the eighties outside, it's really, really hot out there. Um, and he goes, yeah, you know, and it, they, you know, and it gets hotter every year out here. <laughs> and I just paused. I didn't know how to respond at all. <laughs> so I was like, I, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> and, do you have, um, yeah. Do you have data to support that? Yeah. Uh, and I was like, and you, you know, I don't think you'd be able to tell that. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I, so, but I was just like, oh, does it? <laughs> and, uh, but, oh yeah. And people, you know, if you mention something that's pretty off kilter at the, in the galley, when you're having lunch or whatever, you'll get like wide eyed looks across the table. People are terrified of speaking out on this issue. And that's why, you know, people like Patrick Michaels is willing to do it at the expense in some cases of his own career is so important. Yeah. I just like to say, cause Anthony, when she was speaking, Anthony seemed surprised that the oil companies were that, that, that many of the oil, in the oil industry were all in, but it shouldn't surprise anyone. Look, Joe Biden gave his speech this week. Who was among the people he thanked the most for their working with the administration? Cecil Roberts of the United Mine Workers, the, the largest union representing not random mines, coal mines. Biden is doing his utmost to put these guys out of work, but they're bought off. Or at least Roberts, the, the, the leadership is bought off. Used to Actually, we used to work with lawyers at another organization I was with from the United Mine Workers because they were defending the interest of the miners and the mine companies. Now, uh, you throw a few billion uh, at workers put out of work when you close the mine. You throw a few billion to their health care. And uh, he stands up and says, yeah, keep killing our industry. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily that they buy into climate change is that they buy in to getting money from government uh, for agreeing to go get along to go along it's it's yeah. also just the easiest it's all about way. the money it's just like it's just like watergate follow the money that's all this is about it's also just the easiest way to keep going with like the current paradigm while saying you're like if you just go out there and say like we're doing all this stuff for climate we're working on esg see we've got our esg scores and stuff and then continue to act the same way but you're in cahoots with uh, crony. I mean, essentially it's cronyism with uh, legislators that are willing to take money from lobbyists. You can continue to operate the exact same way and then earn brownie points with the public by talking about how environmentally conscientious you are. And if there's the shift, because uh, you're in cahoots with the government, you'll be the ones that they go to first for that shift. It's just a well, way to preserve the, your, your, your market segment, essentially. Well, well yeah, and I, I would say that 
what I think is happening a lot is, especially with the bigger companies, it's an anti-competitive, um, mm -hmm. I guess, strategy to push for more legislation because they do. BP, Exxon, many of those companies will will lobby for more emissions uh, mandates and stuff because that oh, puts yeah. a smaller mom and pop businesses out of business. Like they can't wage, keep exactly. up with the standards. So, uh, and, and, you know, small refiners can't keep up with the standards and all of that. So it's anti-competitive. And I, I wrote an article about this that was in, uh, ended up getting published in uh, Jack Posobiec's um, uh, site about Ooh. how I really don't want to hear the American Petroleum Institute complain about the state of the oil industry when they've been lobbying for cap and trade for years, you know, <laughs> I, uh, like I, I don't want to hear it. I'm so tired of people being shocked that the government's actually doing what they've been saying that they're going to do and that you have assisted in pushing. Um, it's yeah, unless you want to turn around and, and reformat your website to say, you know, never mind. We think that these uh, policies that we've been advocating for are actually more harmful than beneficial, um, you don't you don't get to complain when the government actually puts into practice what you've been asking for. It'll end up just mirroring this, the cigarette industry, like, oh yeah, you know, we were wrong back then, but we're 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 well, wrong. you know, when 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 I first started Not doing this industry, industry. sorry, goes uh, sh so shortly after I first started doing this, uh, working on climate issues as opposed to environmental issues, um, oil and gas companies. Uh, were allied with coal companies. And then it turned out that the gas industry found out, gosh, if coal goes under, they're going to replace it with gas. They'll call it a transition to a cleaner future. And so they were all in favor of killing the gas industry. I mean, killing the coal industry. And they would come out and say, oh yeah, coal's so dirty. Mm. We've got we to clean yep. gas. And, and, uh, and the thing is, at the time, we were warning them, look, <laughs> you're you're going to be next on the hit list and mm -hmm. it won't be that long and of course uh it's not like i was a genius here or super prescient but it was right <laughs> you know ask anyone in the industry how it, whether they're in the sites now uh that coal was in 15 and 20 years ago sterling don't be so modest you're always a genius <laughs> no. um all right, so we should probably talk about uh, Joe Biden's, you know, he was maybe going to declare an emergency declaration. He chose not to, but he did talk about how he was going to use uh, the powers of the executive branch to push climate regulations on people. I've got a video clip here just from his speech, so let's go ahead and play it. Change is literally an existential threat to our nation and to the world. We need to act. We just take a look around. Right now, one 100 million Americans are under heat alert. 100 million Americans. 90 communities across America set records for high temperatures just this year, including here in New England as we speak. And by the way, records have been set in the Arctic and the Antarctic, temperatures that are just unbelievable, melting the permafrost. It's, it's, it's astounding the damage that's being done. Not a single Republican in Congress stepped up to support my climate plan. Not one. So let me be clear. Climate change is an emergency. And in the coming weeks, I'm going to use the power I have as president to turn these words into formal, official government actions through the appropriate proclamations, executive orders, and regulatory power that a president possesses. Ah, the, the idiocy behind that speech is just absolutely sickening. First of all, the amount of high temperatures that we had this week is nothing unusual. It's summer in the Northern Hemisphere. Heat waves happen. They have happened since forever. And, you know, compared to the summer of 1936, where we had massive heat waves throughout the United States and people died. I mean, literally, uh, livestock was wiped out. Scroll further down, Andy. Um, you see that graph right there. That graph right there is from the EPA. And that shows the spike in high temperatures that happened during the Dust Bowl period. What we're experiencing today is nothing compared to that. We're experiencing weather events, high pressure ridges, things like that, not climate change. And they don't even have the science behind this right. Climate change is a raise of the average temperature of the Earth. 
but most of it happens in the low temperature because at night, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere retards slightly the emission of infrared heat from the surface of the earth up into space. It blocks it a little bit. It slows it down. And so it, it slows down the overnight temperature loss. And therefore, the overnight temperature goes up. High temperatures have been flat in the United States for decades. It's the same elsewhere. High temperatures are not an indication of climate change or global warming. This, the, the, the advisors to President Biden just totally screwed this up. <laughs> I have you know, literally nothing to add to that. <laughs> I, there was Maybe they got headline. Bill Nye the science guy to advise them. I don't know. <laughs> there was a great headline in one report that I just loved. Biden's climate talk, an empty speech from an empty field. I mean, that, that, yeah. really, that really sums it up. I mean, he's sitting at an industrial site that they've destroyed, uh, uh, a, premature, uh, a, a, a coal fuel power plant that they closed. And he kept talking about all the great things that wind is going to do. I suspect the wind power, the wind turbines uh, are not going to replace all the power that the coal plant did. They certainly won't replace it uh, with the uh, reliability and on-demand um, uh, availability that the coal plant provided. In the process, what these, uh, what they're going to be doing is producing wire there to link to the offshore wind. Well. How much wire do you need? How long will those jobs be around? Um, and then in the process, they're going to destroy the ocean. You know, they're, they're going to they're going to take an ocean. They always complain, oh, well, people are developing. We're, we're taking wildlife habitat. Well, the oceans are some of the last true wild areas, and they're going to put wind turbines all over them, right in the midst of right whale, endangered right whale migratory routes. Uh, they don't want the oil and gas industry to go in there and do test uh, sonic test to, uh, which are temporary things to discover whether there's oil there, but we're going to put permanent, <laughs> uh, offshore wind turbines right in the middle of the route. Uh, I'm sure that yeah. won't disturb the whales. It will destroy the fishing industry there. They're suing to block these things. He talks about the jobs it creates. He's not talking about the jobs it destroys and it will yeah. do nothing to save the climate. And all his speech, his entire speech was based on uh, you know, his policies are his response to the threats from climate change. But all the threats he cited were lies. They were all lies. Are hurricane are tornadoes worse than they've ever been? No. Are hurricanes worse than they've ever been? No. Wildfires? No. Heat? No. In fact, who says so? His own agencies. But his speechwriters put it in there and he said it when he wasn't saying, oh, well, I, I got cancer from a refinery. Uh, or when which, he wasn't just mumbling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest, to be fair about the cancer thing, I think he just got overexcited and, and you know, I, I think in, in law they called it an excited utterance that yeah. he, uh, he he got wrapped up in the moment and wanted to, me too, I'm getting hurt too. Uh -huh. it, it, it turns out that, you know, he, he had skin cancer and no one's ever linked that to uh, refine. You know, it's like his doctor said, he used to be in the sun a lot when he was a, a kid. Uh, no, to, to be true, to be fair, uh, you can look at him now and see that he hadn't been in the sun a lot lately. Neither have I. Look, right? You, you know, you, pasty. You, you brought up guys. job creation. I actually do have a clip of Biden talking about job creation. Uh, so let's play it and just see what he exactly had to say. When I think about climate change, and I've been saying this for three years, I think jobs. Climate change, I think jobs. Almost 100 wind turbines going up off the coast of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, with ground broken and work underway. Jobs manufacturing 2,500 ton steel foundations that anchor these offshore wind farms to the sea floor. I've directed my administration to clear every federal hurdle and streamline federal permitting that brings these clean energy projects online right now and right away. There you go. I mean, there's Biden talking about jobs. By the way, uh, who, who had the hilarious comment? Um, I just wanted to give him props. A Abel Windsor, the climate change theory is as strong as AOC's handcuffs. Hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Nailed that one. Yeah. Just have to give you props. <laughs> so he said it right there. A hundred wind turbines. Now, offshore wind turbines are a bit bigger than uh, um, onshore wind turbines. And the winds out there 
while not constant, blow uh, a bit more regularly. So let's say there's 100 wind turbines. Let's say they're four or five megawatts. Well, that's 500 megawatts. And if it works, let's give it really props and say it works 50% of the time. Uh, that's not as much as a, a, that's not nearly as much as a, a 500 megawatt coal power, power plant or a natural mm -hmm. gas plant or a thousand megawatt nuclear plant. You know, it's just, it's not an apples to apples comparison. Absolutely not. Yeah. They, they these wind turbines are mm -hmm. dramatic failures in lots of places. We, we've seen it happen in Texas. We've seen it happen in California. The ugly truth behind wind turbines providing power is the fact that at night, between the transition of day and night, you know, at sunset, wind dies down. And that is exactly the time when power use peaks because people come home and they start their cooking, they turn on their TVs and so forth and so on. Or if they're green, they plug in their electric cars. Well, gosh, that's what happened in California a couple of years ago. The grid was within a couple of minutes of collapsing if they hadn't taken emergency measures because the wind died and the solar died at the same time, right at sunset. You can't run any stable country or economy on wind and solar power alone. You've got to have stable backup, and that's either coal or hydro or nuclear. That's the bottom line. The Herman Van Newkirk has a great point there you know um uh, uh this one mm -hmm. anthony talked about what's going on in the u.s look europe's far ahead of us in this and most of their wind is not actually fair. on land it's it's offshore uh and uh the wind died yeah. for six months primarily largely uh during the winter last year power prices went through the roof as they scrambled to make up and uh, people didn't have power. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is not. But they don't theoretical. care. That's the problem with these greenies. They do not care. Well, it can, I it's go not, step... it's, but, but the thing is, it's not theoretical. This is real life. This is happening now. We don't have to speculate what might happen if they add more of this stuff to the grid. We can see what is happening in California every summer, in Texas a couple of uh, years ago, and in Texas even you know during the winter. And uh, with warnings where I live in Texas daily um, about uh, power and what happened in, like I said, Europe, that's so far ahead of us in this. And these were offshore wind turbines, the very things that are, like I said, more efficient, produce more power or larger um, <laughs> for six, for, for three to six months, they just weren't providing uh, you know, they were providing about five to seven percent of the power Europe needed. Uh, Europe was expecting from them. It's not good. It's not a good, pretty picture, folks. Well, on the bright side, we do have Biden's uh, executive actions here, and I'm sure we're all going to be happy because it, it's all about boosting offshore wind. Exactly like we're all, you know, desiring. You know, if we scroll down a bit here, uh, protecting communities from extreme heat and danger. Essentially, they're going to be giving homes air conditioners. I can tell you that they're going to do this in the least efficient way possible. I bought an air conditioner on Amazon for like 10 bucks the other day. I don't think they're going to be handing those out. I don't really think they're going to be handing out air conditioners at all. They're talking about job growth with, with these wind turbines. I mean, they're doing literally everything antithetical to what we've said this entire, this entire broadcast. Linnea, I mean, what, like how, what, what do you, what do you think about this? Just doing every, like you're, you worked in the energy industry, you know how inefficient uh, wind is and you know how efficient traditional sources of energy are. Is this just going to destroy the entire energy grid? Well, right now, uh, wind and solar only make up about something like up to 12% of power generation in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, a lot of times when they say renewables, they're lumping hydro in there too. Yeah. Uh, and they have been trying to get rid of a lot of dams lately, actually, because uh, Delta River smelt, whatever it happens to be that they're worried about. Uh, the Greens do not like hydro, and that's probably the best uh, source of power besides, uh, you know, wind and or it's better than wind and solar, uh, but it still has problems during the dry period. Uh, it's also, you know, it's it's not... Um, Boy, I'm, I'm blanking on the word. Uh, it, you, it doesn't scale up when you need it. You can't control yeah. how much of the power is coming on. Um, mm -hmm. You, For every 
bit of renewable intermittent power you have, you need this an equivalent backup of a dispatchable power source. Dispatchable, that's the word. Uh, and that's usually going to be nuclear or natural gas or coal, something that it's easy to turn it up when demand goes up. Um, and let's think about, you know, in the coming months, what what's the biggest draw of power in the average household? You have heating. NFL football? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, heating and air conditioning are probably your biggest uh, power drains um, from the grid. Refri so re Refrigeration what? is most refrigerators. Constant, refrigerators are a pretty big one. Um, also... I think um, uh, washer and dryers, oh, yeah. dryers especially, are really big. Uh, but the most expensive thing that draws a lot of power is, according to um, some statistics that I was looking at just yesterday, actually, is heating. So when you get into the wintertime, heating is going to be your one of your bigger price points. And it's also extremely energy intensive. So as much as people are complaining about heat waves and, and how difficult it is in Europe where they don't have as many air conditioning units, um, if, if you can't heat your home in the winter at night or from that 2 o'clock to 8 p.m. period when uh, energy use is highest, that's a disaster. That's... I mean, and and all the studies that look into climate-related deaths show that cold kills ten times as many people as high temperatures do. So, um, you know, if if we're going to increasingly depend on these power sources that turn off <laughs> during you know that two o'clock to eight, and then later into the night uh, period, we're we're they're in for a lot of trouble over there, especially when winter comes. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> there you, you go. Have the Jack Nicholson from The Shining. <laughs> they, the, the wind and, and solar. To be fair, right? that's a Hollywood prop. He didn't actually freeze. Oh damn. Oh bummer. <laughs> <laughs> wind, wind, wind and solar provide uh, great power, except when they're needed the most. Uh, you know, uh, the saucy winch comment was was perfect. You know, I've yeah. said before, a uh, hundred, a hundred and fifty years ago, people used to stand on the street corners of major streets with placards saying "Repent, the end is near," <laughs> and rational people would cross the street to avoid them. Uh, nowadays, we invite these people into the halls of Congress to testify. Uh, or to the UN, you know, uh, um, yeah. small girls uh, get to confront the UN because they're climate experts, yeah. or uh, these climate scientists that are that are like fortune tellers. They and 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 what are their what's their crystal ball? It's a computer model. <laughs> ah, oh, I'm singing in front of my keyboard and I put balls. in. Yeah, I, that I, magic I, eight I, ball. I'm sitting in front of my keyboard, and I put in some numbers, assuming this is what CO2 will look like, and assuming this is what the impact will be. And voila, ooh, I have a fortune. Uh, you know, it's it's. God. We we did an episode previously. I don't think either Anthony or Sterling you were on, but we we showed how much like uh, each how these models will factor in each uh, just different, different sources of energy. I mean, they, they don't factor in the sun. Like on some of the models, it was a zero. Uh, we should, we should go back to that again <laughs> in the future, but it's, it's insane. Yeah, listen, I'll tell you what, you can put all the CO2, water vapor, methane, uh, uh, any other greenhouse gas CFCs into the atmosphere you want. If the sun wasn't out there, <laughs> it, it wouldn't, the planet would not be a warm place folks. Uh, <laughs> because uh, the greenhouse only works if there's a sun to light it, you know, even okay. in greenhouses, even in greenhouses where they really, really pump up the CO2, uh, to make plants grow. They add artificial sources of heat because sunlight filtering through is still not enough to get it yeah. to be the optimum. Anthony, you just uh, sent me something, I think, related to the we comment. We had a comment come from Stephen Lloyd. Yes, uh, the, the increase in weather alerts. Yeah, I wanted to address that because that's something that uh, I've been actually looking at a lot. Um, we have been getting more and more weather alerts. They've created in the last 30 years about a half a dozen new weather alerts that didn't exist before, including, you know, excessive heat warnings and things like that. And so the weather services around the world are warning over things that weren't a bother 
years ago. Mm-hmm. I mean, when we had the Dust Bowl, we didn't have the Weather Service putting out excessive heat alerts or whatever. They just put out the forecast and they let you deal with it the way that you're supposed to deal with it. But I want to show you a picture of what's been going on in the UK. Um, it's a little here, pixelated, but yeah. Yeah, it's a small picture, but this is a comparison of BBC weather maps in 2012 and 2022 in the summer. Now, if you look hmm. closely, you can see that some of the temperatures uh, in the first map in 2012 are actually a little bit lower than the map in 2022. But what they've done is they've <laughs> filled in the entire nation of the UK in blazing hot red to make it look like it's even more of a crisis. I also have pictures like this from Germany and the United States. The bottom line is, is that the media is is complicit in trying to make more warnings, more alarm, more worries for the general public. And, you know, they're doing it over temperatures that are not critical. I mean, yes, it's worse in the UK because they don't have air conditioning in most cases. But here in the United States, they've really got apoplectic over, you know, making weather bulletins about heat waves. I, I wish you'd even shown a different graphic that, you know, you shared you shared some graphics with me earlier, Anthony. And the one this is what I didn't know. this. OK, I didn't know this. The one that you showed where it was comparing uh, Western Europe to Eastern Europe. Okay, let me fact, pull that okay, up. Yeah, because it's like, oh, oh my God, I keep hearing about these heat waves. It ain't all over Europe because in other parts of Europe that no one is reporting on, they're having unusually cold temperatures. Um, now, Andy, I'm sending that to you right now. And you can pull it up. While but, you guys do that, I'm going to address uh, Jim's comment real quick. He says, good luck escaping a hurricane's whoops, path or getting one. out of your devastated town in your EV, even if you're able to fully charge it. I want to point out, down here in Louisiana, they shut down the power in many cases before the hurricane actually makes landfall to avoid you know, sparking electrical lines in water and stuff. So that's totally correct. You would be in some serious trouble if you were totally dependent on the power grid in order to have any kind of mobility. Right, huh. which is why the sales of, of personal electric generators for your homes from natural gas and so forth are skyrocketing around the nation. Whole house generators are like almost a complete necessity down here. You, uh, it is miserable if you don't have one because, of course, you know hurricane season comes in the summer when it's as hot as possible. So right. when you're out of power for a day or three days, if you're lucky, um, you know, and you only got kind of sideswiped by the storm. You know, they're scrambling to put stuff back together and to pull trees off of the power lines and everything. Uh, And it's in the 90s and humid and your house is slowly getting hotter and hotter and hotter because you (laughs) haven't put in a whole house generator. It's misery. You're you're never supposed to drive through standing water, uh, but people do it. And every time there's a storm, every time, right, people do it. I'm not sure. I haven't looked into it, but I'm not sure I'd want to drive through standing water in an electric vehicle. Probably not. <laughs> that, yep. that just doesn't sound like a, a good idea to me. Uh, that, that sounds like death, like literal death. <laughs> uh, uh, and then right. a, a lot, not a lot of people know this. And then, Anthony, uh, we'll go to you right after this. But 20% of people who do buy our electric vehicles return them within, I believe, two weeks. I mean, they get them and then they realize, wow, this is highly inconvenient. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a staggeringly high number um, and it's just worth knowing. But, uh, Anthony, back to you. Yeah, okay. So, Sterling, you were asking about that map of Europe, and I sent that to you, Andy. Yes. Um, So, if you can pull that up. There it is. Okay, so this is from uh, July 19th, the peak of the heat wave going on in the UK and Europe. And notice the dichotomy here. We've got this massive amount of heat in Europe and the UK, and below normal temperatures over on the eastern side of Europe and into Russia and the Ukraine and Norway and Finland. What's going on here? Well, it's weather. This is a regional <laughs> weather pattern. We've got a high pressure bridge over the UK and Eastern and Western Europe, and we, we don't over the other parts. And so they're screaming about this, you know, record high temperatures, proof of global warming, proof of climate change. Well, it's all hogwash. This is just a weather pattern. And we've been seeing weather patterns like this in the summer for millennia. There's nothing unusual about this. I will and, say and, that. But- go ahead. I was just going to say, but it's not just weather. That that picture makes it clear. What's happening is weather, but what's being reported on is just alarm. They are ignoring, if you as you look at the screen, they're ignoring the entire right side of the screen, which is much larger than the portion under the heat dome. 
it's it, they're point. not they're not talking about that at all. Yeah, they're not. And that's the that's the problem with the media. I mean, I was in television for 35 years and I'm still in radio now. And I can tell you this, the maxim of if it bleeds, it leads is totally true and even more true today than it used to be. Media is all about getting those eyeballs. It's about getting those ratings. And so they will chase after any story that is sensational. And if it's not sensational enough, they will work to sensationalize it. I've seen it in person happen. And I can tell you this. Yeah, there I am. <laughs> there I am. Um, you know, and it just, the media will chase a story like beagles after a fox on a fox hunt. And they'll do that until the fox is dead. And then when the fox is dead, they move on to the next one. But they will accentuate and they will they will build up a story beyond any reasonable factual discourse just to get those numbers. You know, Anthony, I, I you may have said I, I may have missed this because I was looking for the picture of you. But uh, did you ex I just slam the table? Apologies. Did you experience in your time and as working as a meteorologist uh, pressure to start pushing the, the climate alarmist uh, narrative? Was that something you dealt with much or was that a bit after? Well, most of the reporters knew not to ask me questions about it because <laughs> I they could, would get more information that they wanted. <laughs> so, but I will tell you this, yes, there were some some green horns yeah. that came through that absolutely had no clue about this. And I will say this with complete conviction. The majority of reporters out there have no idea about science. Science and math is hard, and they can't do these things, so they become reporters. And they can talk about, you know, social issues and what's happening at City Hall and the latest murder down on the street and so forth and so on. But when it comes to science, they are completely out of their depth for the most part. And they will take anything that comes from the climate science alarmist community and repeat it verbatim because they do not have the skills to even think it through. Yeah. Um, are you telling me that the beautiful woman on the Weather Channel isn't an expert in, you know, uh, whatever? <laughs> I'm not going there. Sorry. <laughs> I, I would. Uh, all right. But yeah, no, I was genuinely curious of your of your um, experience with that. Um, yeah, it's it just yeah. The, 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 the weather community. And, and I will say this. Fortunately, the weather community is held in check by the fact that most news directors that are after ratings know this. Half of their audience doesn't want to hear about climate change during the broadcast, you mm -hmm. know, and that reflects the poll numbers. So typically uh, uh, there there's not as much of it going on in television as there could be because news directors know they're going to turn off half of their audience if they start talking about some of this stuff uh, in a way mm -hmm. in the middle of the weather report. People just want to know, is it going to rain tomorrow? What do I need to wear? And what's the weekend going to be like? That's the sum total of the information that needs to be imparted during a weather broadcast. They don't need to know about climate change. They don't need to be lectured about you should be driving an EV. They don't need to be lectured about, you know, uh, using less or whatever. They just want to know how to plan their life and how to live their life. That's what weather forecasts on television are all about. For tomorrow's weather, you know, Jim, we have a strong case of uh, climate change. You're going to want to make sure you drive your electric vehicle and... Uh, on, on on Wednesday we're we're going to see a mild climate. I mean, yeah. But charge it. But charge it well in advance, and then don't use it until climate. Oh change yeah, and comes. not from five p.m. to nine p.m. because you know we we can't support the yeah. grid at that point due to to the heavy yeah. climate change coming in from the west. You know, uh, um, Anthony said, and 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 Jim said it more clearly. He said the majority of reporters are morons. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, it, it's probably true that most reporters and, and, and including science journalists can't do complex math. Honestly, you get beyond a certain stage. I can't do the most complex of math. But what what what's different between me and them, I think, is not mm -hmm. our level of intelligence. It's that they're lazy. Mm -hmm. It is not hard if the Sierra Club or the Natural Resources Defense Council or some climate alarmist group sends you a press release to actually do a modicum of investigative research and find out how accurate some of their claims are. Data mm -hmm. exists. I can get on the internet anytime and find out if, if someone tells me food is uh, food production is collapsing. Oh my God, people are starving because we're not producing <laughs> enough food because of climate change. I can get on the UN's website easily and they do the calculations for me. I just punch in, where, what region, what indices, 
what crop, and they produce a beautiful graphic that tells me. So if they exercised a, a modicum of journalistic uh, 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 effort, intelligence, effort, and um, curiosity, and uh, just a modicum of uh, thought, they would know whether these claims should just be repeated, as, as Anthony said, verbatim, as if they were news, as opposed to uh, news, so-called news releases from uh, activist groups that have an agenda. But they don't do that. Yeah, and you know, you said uh, data exists, and I do want to just point to a the first thing we showed, which was uh, the Patrick Michaels clip about them trying to delete all those emails and make sure that data and that information doesn't exist. And then Anthony, I uh, pulled up something you wrote in the past year about the National Interagency Fire Center hiding uh, data from the past to, to support their narrative. So data does exist, but they are taking every effort they can to make sure it, mm -hmm. uh, it it's gone. <laughs> like that wasn't my in, greatest it, sentence ever, but you understand. Yeah, the point. inconvenient <laughs> data has got to be disappeared, like yep. from, from yep. George yep. Orwell. And that's why we exist here at the Heartland Institute because we find this, we archive it, and we bring it to your attention. Yep. Yeah. All right. I mean, honestly, I think that's the perfect way to end the episode. So first, let me play the outro song because I freaking love it. And uh, that's got to happen. Outside of that, thank you all for joining this episode of Climate Change Roundtable. We are live every Friday uh, at noon. <laughs> um, subscribe to the channel. Please hit the bell. We love when we uh, we love when you're all active in the comments. It's honestly like a lot of fun to interact with you all. Other than that, uh, Climate Change Weekly, Sterling writes it, comes out every week. It's a great, um, it's a great, uh, I don't know what to call it. Um, I don't know. Ster Sterling, pitch climate change, week climate change Weekly for me. Oh, yeah. Go to Climate Change Weekly and sign up. we got got uh, five or 6,000 subscribers now. Go to Climate Realism every day uh, where we put up something new. All right. There we go. That was better than I was doing. All right. Thank you all for joining. We will catch you all next week.